This is a lecture on the genetic regulation of longevity and what we know about the genetics of aging from studies in uh, the model organism Acerovisiae or yeast. And this lecture is for um, September 4th, 2020. And so today um, in this lecture we're going to talk a little bit about how um, extra chromosomal RDNA circles can act as what's known as a biological clock. For yeast, we're going to talk a little bit about the genetics of both SIR2 um, and mTOR genes, uh, as well as what type of proteins these genes encode and how they actually work to affect lifespan in yeast. So in order to talk about yeast genetics, um, as well as um, lifespan in yeast, we have to talk first a little bit about the yeast life cycle. And so yeast can exist in two different uh, chromosomal states. They can exist as haploid, um, in a haploid state, or with one set of chromosomes, as you can see here. And haploid yeast generally reproduce by budding, which is the formation of a small um, bud that ultimately will grow and um, become genetically identical to its parent cell. And so budding is akin to mitosis in um, higher organisms. But yeast can also reproduce um, in a diploid form. And so if you have a haploid yeast of a particular mating type, in this case, case alpha, and a yeast of the opposite mating type that is also haploid, in this case, A mating type, you have alpha and A haploid yeast coming together and fusing to form a diploid yeast cell, which can also reproduce by budding. And um, diploid yeast can reform the haploid state by for forming what are known as ascospores or spores, uh, which are haploid, and then can enter back into that haploid life cycle. And so what's important to note and what helps sort of age uh, yeast or see how old they are, at least in terms of how many times they've reproduced, is by looking at what are called bud scars, because every time this process of budding happens, whether the organism is haploid or diploid, it leaves behind a trace or a bud scar. And the yeast cell will generate about 20 to 30 daughter cells, or those identical budded cells, um, in, its life, in its lifespan. Um, and so the more bud scars, or the more times the yeast has replicated, um, the older that yeast cell is. And so using the number of bud scars, which you can see here in this EM, can actually help you identify how old the yeast is, at least in terms of replicative age, or how many times it's reproduced before. And although bud scars are used to kind of correlate to age, there's no evidence that the formation of a bud scar actually causes anything to do with aging. It doesn't cause this rapid decline that you can see here, right? So it's correlative with age of yeast, but it's not causative, it doesn't actually age them. And what's interesting is that the genetic mechanisms that do control replicative senescence, or this basically decrease in the rate of reproduction seen around 20 bud scars, um, is still pretty much unknown. And so we don't really know what genetics control the senescence in yeast cells as of yet. Um, and we know that bud scars correlate with yeast age, but they definitely don't cause senescence. So what do we know? We do know that there are these particular forms of DNA, particularly called ribosomal DNA or RDNA, that are in the nucleolus of yeast cells, and they can form what are known as ERCs or extrachromosomal RDNA circles uh, via recombination. And so RDNA is very repetitive, and each one of those repeats can be seen here as basically a, a thick line. Um, and the RDNA, as I said, is located in the nucleolus, which forms ribosomes. And in a young yeast cell, this DNA is able to replicate relatively easily. Um, however, as yeast cells age, there's a higher chance for recombination events. And those recombination events produce these ERC circles or these extra chromosomal RDNA circles. And those ERCs can accumulate over time. So an older yeast cell will have a larger accumulation of ERCs than a young yeast cell. And that's because this process of excision, as well as 
um, forming an ERCV or a combination, um, the chances increase over time. And the accumulation of ERCs is not only correlated with the age of the yeast cell, but also with replicative senescence, or basically the stopping of replication for a yeast cell and its inability to bud and form new yeast, as well as with a shortening of lifespan. So if you take a young yeast cell and then you take some isolated ERCs from a different cell and put them into the young yeast cell, you can automatically shorten its lifespan. And so the presence of these ERCs is enough to shorten the uh, lifespan of a young yeast cell. And that's likely through um, fragmentation of the nucleolus from the accumulation of these ERCs, which will ultimately lead to cell death. And so why do ERCs lead to a decrease in lifespan? Why can you take them um, and then put them into a young yeast cell and see this decrease in longevity? Um, one other protein that's involved in the formation of ERCs and kind of preventing that is what's known as the SIR2 protein. It's encoded by the SIR2 gene, and that SIR2 protein is a histone deacetylase which is a modifier of chromatin, right? And so histone deacetylases remove the acetyl groups from histones and turn off gene expression. And so in a young yeast cell that has wild type or normal SIR2 gene expression, you'll see the SIR2 protein, this histone deacetylase, basically deacetylating or stopping expression of our DNA or that ribosomal DNA. And in doing so, it actually stops the formation of ERCs. And so SIR2 decreases our DNA expression. And in the process, decreases formation of ERCs. However, as the yeast age, you can see the removal or that loss of SIR2 expression that then allows the rDNA to become expressed and start to form ERCs, which will ultimately lead to cell death. And so you can imagine that if you have an overexpression of SIR2 or a lot more SIR2, you can extend lifespan by keeping the rDNA expression suppressed for a longer period of time. So that overexpression of SIR2 will increase lifespan by decreasing ERC formation. Whereas if you delete SIR2, you see the opposite, where you're promoting formation of ERCs and therefore decreasing lifespan. And you can actually see that here. So this little delta sign or this triangle after SIR2 implies a deletion of the SIR2 gene. And so a deletion of SIR2 will increase ERC formation and therefore decrease lifespan. And so you can add even another level of regulation to this genetic pathway. So first, we linked increasing ERCs to aging and decreased lifespan. Then we linked SIR2 decrease to an ERC increase to decrease lifespan. And now we can add in the environment. And so SIR2 expression, or the expression of the SIR2 gene and the protein as a result, is highly subject to the me uh, me metabolic environment. And so when there's a lot of food around for the yeast, they have a high rate of metabolism. And that high rate of metabolism means a lot of cellular respiration. And if we think way back, 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 back to cellular respiration, uh, one of the main byproducts through the Krebs cycle as well as glycolysis is NADH. And NADH is a reduced form of this molecule here called NAD+. And so when there's a high rate of metabolism, all of this NAD is converted into NADH. And that low concentration of NAD inactivates the SIR2 gene expression and when you don't have SIR2, you don't have the histone deacetylase, your chromatin stays acetylated, our DNA can be expressed 
and make a lot of ERCs. However, in a food poor environment or with a little bit less nutrition, the rate of energy metabolism decreases, which means respiration decreases, which means less NAD plus being converted to NADH. And as such, that NAD plus concentration goes up. NAD plus can activate SIR2 expression. And that means you're making the histone deacetylase protein. The histone deacetylase can remove acetyl groups from chromatin. And when it does that, it turns off expression of RDNA and it decreases the formation of those ERCs. And when you have less ERCs, you can extend lifespan. And so altogether, a food poor environment can actually extend lifespan in yeast. Which is sort of interesting to think about because we generally think more food means more growth, which would mean better lifespan. But actually in the case of yeast, we're talking about amount of replication, right? And so in a food poor environment, we can kind of slow replication down. And every time you slow down that process of the yeast replicating, you extend the yeast lifespan as a result because it can only divide so many times, right? And if you prevent it from dividing quite as quickly, it can live longer. And so having a slightly less nutritious environment can actually end up extending the, the lifespan of the yeast via this pathway um, and SIR2 and ERC, um, a decrease in ERCs.